kind and wholly over the top words. Uh, thank you, Setra, for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some ideas with you on this big stage, meant metaphorically as well as physically. And um, thank you also for your forbearing, because I know that it is now 5.31. And so you've been sitting patiently for at least 31 minutes, but some people arrived early. Um, I give you the undertaking that you will not be late for dinner. Um, I'm going to speak for a while, and then there should be plenty of opportunity for discussion, uh, which I hope will be forthcoming. But I, I would say what I always say, which is that I'm eminently interruptible. And if anyone wants to interject a comment or a question, at any point, please feel free to do so, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, video recorder is rolling. Okay, uh, let's get straight into, into things. Um, this morning we spent some time looking at a particular division within the clan of translation studies, and that led to some lively uh, discussion. I want to start off by considering other kinds of divisions which have been apparent in the overall profession of being a translator, between professional camps with distinct activities such as interpreting, translating in the classic sense, or other modes of translating such as screen translation, whereby there has not, until relatively recent times been a great deal of interprofessional contact between these different groups. Uh, it's quite notorious that the conference interpreters saw themselves as a group apart. They set up their own professional um, association. They created their own deontology, their own code of conduct, and all the rest of it. And I don't think it's a caricature to say that they saw no particular reason to look over their shoulder at what had been said and written in and about translation, either by theorists or by practitioners. Uh, quite simply, these were two discrete activities with perhaps mutual respect, but no more. Likewise, one could hardly say that film subtitlers have been in constant dialogue with legal translators, for example. Or, to take an even more salient example, um, sign language interpreters and conference interpreters. It's only relatively recently that I started looking at what has been written in the field of sign language interpreting to discover a whole literature that actually exists and has been there for, well, let's say, 15 or 20 years, almost without reference to other fields of translating and interpreting. And certainly wholly ignored by the conference interpreting fraternity, and the ignorance was quite mutual, I think. Of course, there's a lot that separates these professions. The concerns, the worries, the absolute requirements to be fulfilled, the time schedules, the deadlines, and so on, all impose their own constraints on, on people in all of these fields, such that they have to attend to their own affairs and they see themselves as we're operating in a distinct environment. And that is true. No one would seek to deny it. But perhaps, and this is really where I'm going, and will be a kind of a leitmotif, if you like, for the, the five talks that I'm going to um, undertake, perhaps there is something to be gained by looking at common commonalities, common ground, between these various modes and fields of interpreting and translating. And perhaps by looking at things from one angle, we can see something which might shed some light on other parts of the whole field. To put that in perspective and perhaps to, to declare straight away where I'm coming from, by training I'm an applied linguist. That's the route whereby I came into translation studies unless you count the fact that um, my first academic job was in a university which was an um, incipient school of translating and interpreter training, which I suppose, in a sense, predetermined my later route as well. But I think, crucially, 
the other common theme throughout these five lectures would be that I see all such events, interpreting, translating, and the various modes within those fields, as being social events, and as being, with very few exceptions, which you can imagine and you can think of and are real, on the whole, acts of communication. Applied linguistics can bring something to the mill, can make its contribution, I feel, to accounts of this whole area of activity. I would be the last person to claim anything approaching exclusivity, and I would concur with the sentiments expressed in today's introduction, that there is no way that linguistics on its own, even a broad linguistics of the kind we have now, can account fully and completely for translating events. Okay, that's, that's a preamble. Two trends, just recently. One is that you know that, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know, Christina Schaffner has at Aston this series of events where she invites a scholar to give a talk. She encapsulates the discussion in a volume and she invites other people to respond to um, the keynote lecture that's been given. And just recently she invited Daniel Gilles to talk and his chosen theme was precisely whether or not translation research and interpreting research had anything to say to each other. And his broader conclusion was that yes, they did, and it was high time we started looking at, at, this, at this line of approach. And Christina kindly invited me to be one of the respondents to Daniel's paper. And that set me thinking along the lines of those strands in my own consideration of interpreting uh, which seem to match up with strands that I've considered when I've been looking at the work of written translators. At the same time as that, and conversely, if you like, um, there has been increasing interest within the broad field of, shall we call it, discourse linguistics, in what I would call interactivity in written texts. So that you have a whole strand of research now, and I've got a roll of names here, which I won't bother to read out, but people like Greg Myers, at Lancaster in the UK, and uh, Thompson and Fetila, and um, Michael Hoey, and others, who look at written texts essentially as records, if you like, traces, because the written text is nothing more than a trace left behind by an act of communication. And in those traces, we can discern elements of interactivity, which, in the words of Thompson and Fetila, point to the enacted role of the writer and the projected role uh, of the reader. As an idea, it's not new, but the body of research is now beginning to gather momentum, and it is relatively recent. Okay. I think that an appropriate way into this bringing together of, of the modes and fields is dialogue interpreting. Dialogue interpreting is not a, a term which I coined myself, uh, I've borrowed it from others, but I find it a convenient label to refer to all those acts of interpreting which take place face-to-face -face and involve dialogue as opposed to the kind of monologue which you get in conferences. I'm, in, I'm indulging in a monologue now, and if we had conference interpreters sitting in the booth at the back, they would be doing monologue interpreting. The kind of interpreting that I'm wanting to talk about, and I'll spend much more time on it later in the week, is that kind of interpreting where an interpreter liaises between two people, or a minimum of two other people, who do not share, or claim not to share, or choose not to share the use of a common language, and hence the ability for an interpreter. Why, why look at that, first of all? Well, there is, I think, a claim for saying that this form of interpreting is the most primitive form of translating that there is. There must, surely, have been acts of dialogue interpreting long before, long before there were acts of written translating, although I'm no expert in that. Um, but also, there are elements of the dialogue interpreting situation which give you some kind of glimpse of the very primitive or prototypic, to use the word from this morning, translation situation. Um, 
For a start, the translator is highly visible. Not in the Venutian sense, but uh, simply the translator is there and you can observe them. The translator is extremely active in dialogue interpreting events. That is, there is no way in which you can conceive of the interpreter as some kind of neutral machine, such as sometimes the translator is modeled as by some commentators. There's plenty of evidence <coughs> in the research literature so far already to show um, that the interpreter, or let's call her a translator in dialogue interpreting, is a genuine participant in a three-way exchange. In other words, the notion that the interpreter is there as some kind of bystander while the communication goes on between the other parties is not sustainable in the light of the available evidence. So this notion of the translator as an active participant in the acts of communication is observable, tangible there in a way which is true of written translating, but you have to write about it, you have to argue the case. You can't just say, look, you can see it. And um, the moves of the translator in dialogue interpreting are, of course, available for immediate analysis and scrutiny in a way that all of the moves of the written translator are not so observable um, and have to be mined uh, via protocol studies or other um, ways of, of getting back to the, the translator's actual action. Finally, the interpreter's moves or the translator's moves in dialogue interpreting are, of course, subject to feedback. And this distinguishes the role of the dialogue interpreter from that of the translator in most but not all situations, in the sense that there is no doubt at all that the interpreter is influenced in her moves by what she is observing of the reaction of participants to the moves that she's already made. Is that clear? It doesn't sound very clear to me. I simply mean that because there is eye contact between all parties at all time in dialogue interpreting, here in the Cartier case, um, the interpreter modifies her stance, her output, and her general disposition in the light of feedback that is constantly being received from the other participants, even if it's no more than a frown of incomprehension or whatever. Okay? So you have all of those things which are distinctive in some way to dialogue interpreting, and yet, and yet, you feel that many of the moves that dialogue interpreters make are there to be seen, to be observed in the work of written translators as well. And um, I'd be the last person to say that these acts of communication are identical. No, simply that there is some measure of common ground. Okay, so let's look at some of these moves within a kind of interactional framework, such as I was mentioning earlier. The example I want to start with is one borrowed from the literature from a long time ago, and it's one I've foisted on some of you before. My apologies for that. But every time I look at this example, I think of different aspects of the act of translating, and um, I see in it a kind of reduction to the minimum, to, to a kind of a minimalist degree, right? of the act of translating. Um, no, I, I'll just, I must introduce it first. In social situations of immigration to the Western world, um, in all kinds of countries, a typical situation would be that second generation children end up acting as interpreters for their first generation immigrant parents. It's the most natural thing in the world. Nobody intends to bring this about. It just happens. The first generation parents come to a country they do not have or are very insecure in the language of that country. They need to communicate. Their children have, have the benefit of schooling in the host country and can do the job. Why pay money when you've got a free employee? That's a caricature. It's not like that. But quite simply, uh, this happens all the time. The ethical problems that it gives rise to 
are very serious. I could digress on that, but I think I shouldn't because I made promises to you earlier. But we can, have, we can look at some of the examples of the ethical consequences of these things uh, later on. But um, Brian Harris, who will be familiar, I'm sure, to, to a lot of you, with his colleague Bianca Sherwood, back in the late 70s, gave us an example which actually of, is of Bianca Sherwood herself, who was a second-generation Italian immigrant to Canada many years ago, interpreting for her father, who was a monolingual speaker of Italian, but who had set himself up in business in Canada and was needing to conclude business deals with monolingual speakers of North American English. And so his daughter was pressed into service whether willingly or unwillingly, we are not told, um, to serve on many occasions as an interpreter for her father. Now, her father had brought his negotiating style, I think it's fair to say, and perhaps I'm, I don't want to get into stereotyping here, but he had brought his negotiating style from um, the style that he had been brought up with, and became very heated in the exchanges with his monolingual English-speaking business partner, uh, not so much because he was losing control, but as a kind of ploy. And so at one point, he turns to his daughter and says in Italian this. Okay. <laughs> Is that legible? Yes. Does anyone need a translation? It's, it's relatively transparent, I hope. I will uncover the rest, but you have to ask yourself, what does the interpreter do faced with this situation? Okay. Now, our interpreter, and one other thing that I didn't say um, in the specificities of dialogue interpreting is, I should have said, it is urgent translating. It is urgent translating. You have a matter of a second or two in which to consider your strategy for dealing with whatever source text has just been thrust in front of your brain. Look at it that way. Okay? So, here we have it. Interpreted to third party. My father will not accept your offer. Now, we could have had fun this morning by considering whether this falls within or out with the limits of what we are prepared to call translating. Is this a translation? Many a scholar within written translation studies who would say, no, this does not qualify as a translation. I think that um, Juliana House, for example, if I read her correctly, would call this a version and not a translation. Whether that's a distinction which is worth making, I leave entirely to one side because I don't want to get into that debate at all. But what is interesting is that within the field of dialogue interpreting, and you know, I've been to these not so much academic conferences but professional conferences where dialogue interpreters get together to discuss common problems and precisely how they how they feel situations like this. Whether or not this response is a translation simply does not enter their mind. It is simply not an issue. What might be an issue is ethics. And quoting someone at, at one of these conferences, they would even go beyond that. They would, um, someone said at a conference to much applause, um, we interpreters do not have a problem with ethics, we have a problem with role. And of course, role is something which is often determined for them by other participants, rather than something which they choose for themselves. But uh, more of that in due course. Of course, in this case, the interpreter's ploy backslide. Because the monolingual father was not as monolingual as all that. And could tell that um, she had not uttered whatever the uh, English was for imbecile or fool. And uh, took her on with, with this. Um, I don't think this is a made-up example. I think there are hundreds of examples of this kind of thing happening day in, day out in dialogue integrity uh, situations. Okay? Now, one first thing you could notice here is that the father, in his 
initial utterance situates himself vis-a-vis -vis the act of interpreting and situates the interpreter vis-a-vis -vis as of what is to be done. This is something which I will introduce in a moment in Goffman's term, footing, which we'll come to uh, immediately. But you could say here that the father is actually acting as the commissioner of an act of translating, rather than the utterer of a source text as such. He is giving a translation instruction. Tell him that he's a fool. Okay? In other words, it's commissioning an act of translation. You could also say that the source text is contained in there somewhere. Uh, secondly, second observation, if we call what we have up there the words on the page, so to speak, um, which we sometimes refer to when we're considering acts of written translating, how easy it is to see in these circumstances that the words on the page reveal so little of what one needs to understand in order to be able to give a proper account of this act of communication. And if we had time, we could start trying to list on paper all of the things that we would need to <coughs> specify in order to formalize this act of communication and account for the moves and motivations and so on. Third point, and here let me be a little bit interactive with you. At this point, <coughs> what would you have done? In other words, what were the translator's options at this stage in the communication? Her father has turned to her and said, tell him he's a fool. Now tell me. Yeah. What, uh, what may break the rule? Literally, okay. it will break the rule. And I would, you know, depends on the, on the situation and the context of the, of the dialogue. I mean, if the, is, if the situation is colloquial or it's, they are in a bar and they are playing cards, so then it's okay to play. No, they're not playing cards. This is a business negotiation. Oh, it's, uh, sorry, it's I mean, a yeah. It's a business negotiation. So Yeah, it could be a, a permanent break. Yeah. Other options? Yeah. And you could look at it from the point of view of target text, the acceptability. Yeah. That sort of the source text, if you want, expression would not be perhaps be acceptable in the cultural environment in which the target text would situate itself. So you would have to choose other options, for instance, say that, well, as you did. Right, okay. Yeah, so in other words, you would be talking about adapting the source text in order to perhaps achieve some intended goal with whatever is appropriate in the target language situation. We're here into cultural differences, aren't we? I suspect, in a big way. But, you know, if you try to look at it from, not from the point of view of what is plausible, uh, in translating, but from the point of view of what the, the, the full list of options are. The first one, which you haven't suggested to me, because it's not very plausible, is that she could have taken what her father said as a source text and simply translated it into it. She could have done that. Okay? You can then think, what would the consequences have been had she taken that option? Not very good, either, hmm? in terms of intended uh, outcomes and so on. But do you see how the way the interpreter positions herself is, first of all, a matter of choice, but secondly, her positioning of herself has an immediate impact on all other participants in the communicative act. And in case you think this option just translating the Italian words, literally, in case you think that is totally plausible, let's just slip in here something which I'll expound on in a couple of days' time, that in courtroom interpreting in the United States, 
the interpreters would be trained to do just that. Just that. If you imagine the, the highly implausible situation where, shall we say, an accused man who knows he's lost the case and he's got nothing to lose, um, says to the interpreter about the judge, tell him he's a fool. If the interpreter follows her training, she will translate for the courtroom, tell him he's a fool in the other language. Okay? Yeah. Unless she was his daughter. And yeah. maybe then she would yeah. make a difference. Good. Which is part of what yeah. is going on here. Yeah. Do you want to say any more about that? Yeah. Well, because then this is an interesting angle. Well, it, it just thinking about it was that here we don't have just any interpreter. And it, it's a daughter. Yes. And that conditions, and among other things, that condition for it is the fact that she's the daughter of, of the guy that's wanting to make a business deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's crucial. And he's not, a, yeah, go on. he's not an official client. He's just her father. So she knows him. She knows his temperament. And so okay. she... So there's no official contract. No. Right? Okay. No. So it's all done on goodwill. But she knows him, which I think is a separate point. It's a, you know, it's a second point. She knows him, and therefore, presumably, she presumably, I presented her as bilingual, she is also presumably bicultural, and can therefore appreciate ways in which things can be made to function in different cultures. But I don't want to speculate too much on these things, but simply to go on down the list, we already noticed, of course she can do this, but as, um, I'm sorry, I haven't got your name yet, but as you said, if she does this second option, you're a fool, this is going to have immediate consequences which are going to be pretty terminal for the rest of the exchange. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. But they might assist him in the process of uh, acculturation. Uh, because they, he, he might well the business this deal. particular business deal, but uh, he might, you know, stop saying that. Right. I said, okay, I'm in a different country and I should perhaps adapt my ways. Yes, indeed. Now, we are, again, sort of skirting around the edges of the problem of ethics here, aren't we? Because that, that underlies, I think, what, what you're pointing out there as well. Yeah. There's also a thing that you cannot get personal. You know, when you're talking to other people, you've got a focus, especially in business, you cannot get personal insulting other people, the impact of the, the insult in Italian is like saying, very slight, it's like I would say, oh, you don't get to you, you don't do it right. But to other person, I guess, it really, really helps. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you, I agree with you, if you transpose your comments to some imagined written translation situation, you see the debate that that would give rise to if we tried to say about a written translation, well, we must excise from the translation anything which might be deemed to be too personal and so on so yeah very short i have the feeling that it's very important to see where father daughter and customer are exactly yes so to see the space yes for instance is the daughter visible from the point yes. of view yes for instance she might smile and be very convincing and tell him, you are an imbecile. And maybe he would simply take it. Maybe. So the entire semiotic yes. situation, for instance, from court interpreting, it's very well known, I know a study about court interpreting in Holland. It's very important where exactly the judge is, much higher than the lawyer, yes. and still much higher than... Yes. These things are so then, of course, he's near, and the judge tells the one who is near, tells the other one that now, not only near in space, but also in language. So. Yeah, maybe she can simply say, "Well, you know, I'm not going to accept that because 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 I'm not going to of course, this is not a very professional situation here that we're looking at, as um, somebody's already pointed out. But in professional interpreting situations, um, the points that Jose just mentioned about who sits or stands where, 
become absolutely crucial for this business of role. And um, when you get trials of someone who, is, who does not share the language of the court, an interpreter is provided, and the interpreter is usually stationed immediately adjacent to the accused person, so that they can do whisper interpreting in their ear, but also there is something semiotic about it. Yeah, this interpreter is acting for this client. But a colleague of mine who served in that capacity in a murder trial in Edinburgh a number of years ago uh, told me of absolutely intolerable pressure that she felt into in, in that situation because, quite simply, she was from the same ethnic group as the accused person. The accused person was in a totally hostile environment and had only one potential ally in the whole situation, and that person was next to him. And consequently, um, the interpreter felt under huge pressure to avoid destroying the neutrality which he was being paid to, to exercise. Okay. So all of these things um, surface. All I'm getting at here is that these issues obviously go way beyond the words on the page, but they are issues which are crystal clear. It doesn't take long to work out all of these things when you are observing dialogue interpreting events. A number of them are present to a greater or lesser degree in a lot of acts of translating. Okay. Um, of course, I didn't complete my list. She could simply have um, turned it into North American English and done something like get real, you know, which perhaps avoids the insult but translates the speech out. Or she could, and you didn't <laughs> offer this um, option, she could have turned to her father in Italian and say, no way, you tell him if that's what you want to say. All of these things of course, uh, not possible. Okay, this, these various moves, which were all possibilities, bring us to what I announced just now, which is the issue of footing. And I want to remind us of some definitions which um, will help us a lot with this. It was uh, Cecilia Wadenscher of, of Sweden who, who was the first person to apply Gotham's ideas on footing to dialogue interpreting in a big way. But again, I look at these ideas because I see them as of potential relevance to any act of translating, be it oral or written. Footing, Goffman defined as the alignment of an individual to a particular utterance, whether involving a production format, as in the case of a speaker, or solely a participation status, as in the case of the hearer. Well, that's clear as mud, of course, but um, production format and participation status will come to immediately. But perhaps to illustrate the idea, another example quoted by um, Goffman himself from the work of the Gumpers is um, a bit of classroom interaction in a secondary school. Okay, teacher to pupils. Now, listen, everybody. At 10 o'clock, we'll have assembly. We'll all go out together and go to the auditorium and sit in the first two rows. Mr. Dock, the principal, is going to speak to us. When he comes in, sit quietly and listen carefully. Don't wiggle your legs. Pay attention to what I'm saying. As Gotham says, it is tempting, if you don't put one, two, three down that side of this, to treat this as a single utterance, which could be studied as a whole and as a unit. But of course, what is going on here is a change of alignment at various points along the way. And when you look at something like that, you realize how, in ordinary, everyday interaction, we are constantly changing our alignment to the people that we are speaking to, and in doing so, changing their alignment towards us. So, it starts with a call for attention, addressed to everybody and anybody within earshot. Now listen up, everybody. And then it goes into an outline of what's going to happen next, using the first person plural. We will do this, and then we will do that, and then we will do the other. 
Okay, so identifying the speaker with the addressees, we're all there uh, in a block. We all have common interests, we're all going to do the same things, and Mr. Dock, the principal, is going to sit, come and speak to us. I doubt very much that Mr. Dock was intending to speak to the teachers, probably to address the pupils, but the use of we is a particular participation format that's being adopted. But then, when the teacher sees somebody in the first row fidgeting, don't twiddle your legs, pay attention to what I'm saying. Suddenly, the rest of the auditorium have become secondary participants. They are no longer being directly addressed. Okay? But they are still there, and they are still hearing what is being said. But the speaker's moves situate the receivers in distinct camps, and this shifts from time to time. Right. Unless, unless you can hear the intonation, but you don't know whether the don't figure your legs belong to the previous sentence or not, because the other sentence have disappeared by them. Correct. Correct. And I think, as I remember it, Goffman makes this, this very point, but um, he is using it to say that, you know, um, hitherto so many instances of spoken interaction have just been looked at as a, a transcription like that. And if you don't have the inst uh, intonation, you would be tempted to treat it all as a unit. And if you have the intonation, then, of course, that is a powerful signal. Oh, well, shift. Well, in, in, in paragraph two, yes. the last sentence, it doesn't imply the past. It says, sit quietly, listen carefully, go to the next. Yes. That's yes. all imperative. Yeah. Yeah. That, in other words, the boundary could be at a different place. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. I think it is intonation, that, uh, as you say. Uh, distinguishes this. Okay, now to cope with this kind of situation, Goffman proposes what he calls a production formula, whereby he says there are three stances that speakers can offer. The speaker is an animator in the sense of just a sounding box that is a machine producing noises, if you like. Um, but may also be, also be an author in the sense of the agent who puts together, composes, or scripts the lines that are being uttered. Or, third, can act as principal, that is, when you are saying something which you are personally committed to, in the sense of they are your own words expressing your own views, and so on and so forth. And a speaker can be all three of those, or simply numbers one and two, or simply number one. When you transpose this to the situation of the interpreter or translator, you begin to see the relevance of these categories to our attempt to, to account for interpreter moves. Okay. Um, participation status was the other part of the definition of footing. And here, it is what I was saying just now about how what the speaker is saying situates the receivers in terms of how they are being addressed or not addressed. And um, Goffman distinguishes four categories, addressees, auditors, overhearers, and eavesdroppers. I don't, we haven't got time, I want to come back to this tomorrow, because I'm going to go into the business of audience design uh, tomorrow, and I want to, to look at that in further detail. So if you can suspend disbelief on that one, um, we, will, we will return to it. Okay. Um, as you will see, if we went back to the, um, the Amécile example earlier, then the various options are the options that the interpreter can take either as animator, that is, mouthing someone else's words, unmodified, unmediated, and taking upon herself, adopting the stance of someone who is simply a sounding box, and nothing more or can act as author in the sense of saying, this person is saying that, but I will use my words to say it. Or can act as principal, taking upon herself to say things which she believes, like, um, there's no way I'm going to translate that, or whatever. Yeah? These are then the categories that we have here. Now, the interesting thing here, or one of the interesting things, is how do other participants take this translated or interpreted output as emanating directly from the person being interpreted or translated. In other words, do they think that what they are receiving 
is the words of the interpreter as author or the words of the interpreter as animator of someone else's words. This ambiguity gives rise to some very interesting situations in work dialogue interpreters, which are awkwardnesses which the interpreters have to resolve as best they may. But it comes about when one participant hears something that has been interpreted, and instead of saying to themselves, this is the interpreter's words I'm hearing, they say to themselves, this must be a translation of what this other person said. It is, they then react to that, perhaps, for example, angrily. It is interpreted back, and the first person says, but I never said that. And they didn't, because the interpreter was acting as author and chose her own words. A nice little example of this, just briefly, from, not from Cecilia Valdenshow's um, 1998 book, which you, some of you may know about, but from her thesis, uh, 1992. Uh, just summarize it here in my own words. So what you've got here is a Swedish-speaking doctor has suggested to a Russian-speaking patient that a thyroid problem has been bothering the patient. So some word in, in Swedish, uh, with the semantics more or less of uh, this has been bothering you. Yes? This is then translated by the interpreter into Russian with a verb. You had to hesitate a little while because she couldn't quite see what is the best verb for this bothering in Russian. And she opted for one which has the dual value of worrying or disturbing. Okay? The patient then immediately reacts and says, oh no, it hasn't been worrying or disturbing me. It's just got bigger. The interpreter then has to translate this back away. And, of course, you know, what is the interpreter to do? Well, one thing you can do as interpreter is adopt the role of principle and say, oh, no, actually, look, there's a misunderstanding. These were my words. It wasn't the doctor's words. So. For fairly obvious reasons, interpreters do not often avail themselves of that possibility because it interrupts the communication. It's an admission in some sense of failure, yes? And it is going to draw attention to the interpreter who, on the whole, prefers not to be drawn attention to. So what uh, Cecilia's um, interpreter actually did here is a kind of a glossing over, right? So she interpreted that, no, it is not that I feel worried or it hurts, but it seems to have grown bigger. And the act of communication has been accomplished. The patient if she knew, would be reasonably satisfied with that reply. The doctor is satisfied with that reply because he doesn't know there's been a problem. That there's been no objection to what he said in the first place. And so, their communication proceeds. But once more, of course, we could, if we had time, pause and think, isn't there an ethical issue there somewhere? Yes. Perhaps if it were a less trivial example than this individual verb, but other things where the interpreter has the choice either of stopping the whole show and saying, no, look, I made a mistake, or perhaps that, that wasn't the most best choice of words, or simply finding a way of maintaining communication, despite the fact that the other two parties are unaware that they have not actually been accurately represented. Um, so, all this to illustrate the production format that is attributed by one participant to other participants in the exchange. And it seems to me that when we're looking at translations, the perpetration of translations, the reception of translations, and the source texts in which they relate, we're not always looking at it in terms of the complete production format and reception of participation status of, the parties, of all the parties that involved. Um, a parallel situation in written translation might be the famous case, if you like, of, the, um, of James Strachey's translations of the works of Sigmund Freud, famous case of translating, as you know, which we won't go into. But um, we now attribute to Sigmund Freud such Freudian vocabulary as the id, the ego, the superego, cathexis, parapraxis, and so on. Freud never used these words. He simply never used these words. They were the translator's terms. 
but we, in our production format, attribute them to the author of the source text. Yeah. So in other words, I see parallels here. There are all kinds of other things which are different, but I see parallels in the, w in the way translations are received and the way receivers of oral or written translations react in terms of the participation status that they attribute to what has been said or written. Okay. If you look at the literature on this kind of thing in written translation, you tend to come across, of course, all of these dichotomies that we're very familiar with. And maybe I'll just spend the last ten minutes or so on a couple of these. Um, I won't dwell on these because they're very familiar uh, indeed. But, you know, Juliana House's overt and cover translation. And from the framework, from the angle that I've been trying to elaborate this afternoon, I would sort of look at the, this distinction and say to myself, okay, so when the, the dialogue interpreter translates, what is it? Is that overt uh, translation or is it covert translation? Okay. Well, it can't be overt translation because we're told in overt translation the source text is tied in a specific manner to the source language community and culture. The source text is specifically directed at source culture addressees. That's not the dialogue interpreting situation. The source text is uttered for purposes of communicating with the target language addressee. Okay, so if it's not overt, then it must be covered translating. But is it? It's not quite clear to me. Um, it is covered in the sense that it is aimed at creating a communication with the receivers of the target language. But in a dialogue interpreting situation, what is exactly covered? And in what sense can we talk of, of covered? Um, we read elsewhere in House's work that the covered translation is not marked pragmatically as a target text of a source text but may conceivably have been created in its own mind. Well, this is manifestly not the case in the dialogue interpreter. So, what I find with dichotomies of this kind is that they are perfectly valid in their own right. They are usable tools, and some people have liked them, other people have disliked them. Some people have used them, but used them to good effect. They have no quarrel with them. But wouldn't it be better, instead of just seeing a dichotomy, simply to see the whole participatory framework in terms of the production and reception formats and so on. The other one that I was going to put up briefly is, um, yeah, I won't bother, I was going to deal with Ernst August book, but I won't um, move on, nor it's documentary and um, instrumental. On this classification, dialogue interpreting would have to be instrumental. But then when I look at the de definition of instrumental, I find a new communicative interaction, yes, which is a valid, if you like, functionalist dichotomy, but what does it tell us about the actual translator behavior? I'm not sure. Interestingly, Christiane Nord's, one of her examples for um, documentary translation uh, is in Gabriel García Márquez's fiction, uh, the place of the fictional entity Macondo, the place where action takes place in Cien Años de Soledad and other Márquez novels. And she says about that, that um, there is no direct communicative contact between the author and the target audience. The target audience plays the part of an observer listening to the conversation of two strange parties. That's 1997, page 50. Well, I don't want to get in deep into this because I'll get myself into very hot water, but um, it's not entirely clear to me that Marquez was writing exclusively for Colombian readers or that he saw Macondo as purely an instrument for uh, communicating with his fellow country persons um, about insider knowledge which they and no others uh, could share. But if you leave the source text bit aside, um, the way uh, this positions the receivers of the target text as people who cannot participate in the experience of the source text seems to me something which I wouldn't have thought 
a lot of people here, from what I hear, would share. But I won't go into that uh, anymore. Again, I find the dichotomy valid in its own terms. It can be useful, although, little aside, I've noticed that when you use it with students and then you ask them in their essays to um, get, um, classify a translation as either documentary or instrumental, they invariably get it wrong. So it's either bad teaching or there's something wrong with the, with the distinction. However, I uh, leave that aside. Um, finally, something which I find more promising because it moves in the same direction that I've been trying to move over the last 40, 45 minutes is um, a little categorization that Anthony Pym made a number of years back in a, an early article in Target where he talks about categories of implied receiver. And you might remember, I, I'll just flash it up very briefly, he was, his impetus for this was a little sort of job announcement he'd seen in Le Monde, the French newspaper Le Monde, where there was an advertisement in English. Sorry, it's um, done things to the lines there. This reads, pre-qualification of international contractors to participate in tenders for the construction, operation, and maintenance of sanitary engineering, irrigation, and afforestation projects. Okay? And it goes on into ever more small print at the bottom of the announcement. But below all the rest of the text is this, in French. La publicité ci-dessus est relative à une pré-qualification internationale des contractants pour participer aux offres concernant la maintenance de l'ingénierie sanitaire, de l'irrigation et des projets de forage au Koweït. Pym's interest was in how this translation, but in inverted commas, is it a translation, positions the reader, and indeed how the whole textual entity positions the reader. And he posits that, first of all, the English text is clearly aimed at English language users who might conceivably be able to respond to this advertisement by the, by the uh, closing date and therefore become true participants in the act of communication. By very definition, non-speakers of English, Pem argues, are excluded, an excluded category. Yes? The translation, he says, could conceivably turn the excluded into participants. But he argues it doesn't really. First of all, you know, the way it's introduced is simply telling you what it's about, but not inviting you to participate. And in any case, if you need that translation, then by definition, you're unlikely to be able to respond effectively, um, felicitously, uh, to the, the offer. Okay? This is uh, Pym's argument. But these categories of excluded receivers, participant receivers, and observation or observers, he calls them. That is, those who, by reading this French text, can observe an act of communication which is going on between other parties, uh, is quite interesting in terms of the kind of framework that I'm stumbling towards here. Okay. You might notice, just got five minutes, I'm hoping to finish at half past so that we can have at least half an hour, a bit more maybe for the discussion. Um, the way it's introduced, la publicité si des relative à, this is a little thing that you put on the front to frame your translation and to present it, and as Pim suggested, it presents it as something which confers upon you observer status, but not um, participant status. Um, in the literature on dialogue interpreting, again, another article, a different one, by Martin ha uh, by Brian Harris, um, on court interpreters in the early days of um, court interpreting used in war crimes trials, an article on the Lishka trial. Uh, it's in a volume edited by Rhoda Roberts in Canada. Um, I can give the references, of course. Um, he relates that contrary to accepted professional practice, in that trial, the interpreter systematically translated um, what witnesses said by, say, by introducing a translation from English into German with Die Zeugen, Die Zeugen antwortet, 
That is, the witness answers that. Or, le président vous demande si, the judge is asking you whether. And when questioned afterwards about why she adopted this uncommon uh, stance, she said that she felt that it reduced the pressure on her. So that when one of the witnesses, uh, in a fit of anger, turns on the interpreter and says, why are you asking me all these pointless questions? She could say, uh, consistent with her own discourse, it's not me asking the questions, it's the court that's asking the questions. And so you see the function of this as a distancing device. Yes? When you compare it, you realize that it is the same move as la publicité si relative à. Instead of simply translating the text, you say, this is what is being said. I, the translator, am in a different position, if you like. Okay? So, the translator's footing. The same as, my father will not accept your offer. Right? My father is saying that. Etc. It's an introductory device. Now, in interpreting, very often, this introductory device is left out because you don't want to keep on repeating, he is saying that, she is now answering that, he is saying that. You can't do that. So it gets left out. But the stance adopted for the rest of what is being said remains the same. So, if a witness says, I don't know, the interpreter can say, he is saying that he doesn't know. But she may just leave out that he is saying that, and just say, um, he doesn't know. The stance remains the same. So you don't absolutely need this framework device here in order for the translation to count as something which is being um, positioned in that manner. And again, you know, you can think of written translation situations uh, for that. Okay. Um, can I throw in a little question? Or yes. A remark at this point? Please. Some of what you've just been saying reminds me. Um, and to suggest that, you know, it, would, it should be possible to describe all translational events in terms of a full participation framework, so that in addition to the orientation of the translator-interpreter as either animator, as in a verbatim re reproducer of others' text, or author, that is, responsibility for the composition of the output, or principle, that is, commitment to one's own text, there will be the orientation of each other participant, source text producer, target text receivers. So that a relevant question will then be, um, for what categories of audience is the source text designed? For example, source language receivers only, as in a film dialogue to be subtitled in another language. Um, target language receivers only, for example, a monolingual witness speaking in court proceedings held in another language. Or all receivers, as in a speech made to the European Parliament um, to be interpreted and translated into other EU languages, which is then the source text which is produced to be aimed at all receivers. Or a source text produced aimed at the translator only, as in, in police stations, could you ask him to spell his name, please, addressed to the interpreter, or for that matter, what we started with, telling me to fool. Yeah? And so you have that question. Then, for what categories of audience is the target text designed, and this is what we get on to tomorrow, following Alan Bell, 1984, audience design, that is, either those people who are being directly addressed by a translation, that is, ratified participants who are being directly addressed, or auditors, uh, rather like when the teacher um, chides one child for wriggling about, the others are there, they're still ratified participants, but they're not being directly addressed, they are auditors. Or overhearers, that would be non-ratified participants, people in the public gallery, in a parliamentary proceeding, and so on. Not being directly addressed, and they're not ratified either. And finally, and here I really do stop, yes. How does the target text position its audience 
as participants, as observers, or as excluded categories. I was going to draw all this together in a wonderful big diagram, but um, I found that my drafting skills weren't up to it, so I stopped. It's just gone half past six, so...